This video is made possible by viewers like you. Recently I've been having technical difficulties with Google AdSense, so my patrons on Patreon have been my lifeline. If you're interested in supporting this channel, check out my Patreon link in the description below. Kibbutznikim get their name in the credits, Geonim get to ask questions for my recap videos, and Nevi'im get an autographed copy of my book. I know these are difficult times, and I wouldn't ask anyone to give if they didn't feel that they could. But to those who can and do, I am in your gratitude. In the mid-10th century, the Geonim of Iraq went from the triumphant authors of a unified Bible, the Masoretic Text, to a squabbling and impoverished institution, relics of a bygone era of Judaism in the shadow of the Sephardic Golden Age. This state of affairs lasted for about a century. By the 1030s, their host, the Abbasid Caliphate, had been reduced to a puppet state of the Iranian Buyid dynasty, who worried that Iraq's Jews had, despite their greatly reduced influence, remained too powerful. Thus, the Buyids shut down the rabbinical schools of Sura and Pumbedita. Finally, in 1040, Chizikia ben David, the last Gaon and the last Exilarch, was tortured and executed. In the following decades, many of the Davidic line families fled to Western Europe, thus beginning the era of the Rishonim. At this point, Jewish culture and religion had been dominated by Sephardic rabbis for nearly a century. But while Spain would remain the center of Jewish power and secular culture, and continue to produce some of the most important Rishonim, the majority of their disciples would ultimately come from further north. Jews arrived in Ashkenaz in two waves. Though originally brought to the region as slaves following the First Jewish-Roman War, the first Jews of Ashkenaz had risen to a vibrant community by the time of Constantine. When Rome fell, and Upper Germania became part of the Frankish realm, many more Jews from around the empire took refuge there, as the ruling Merovingians had no interest in implementing any persecutions, except for Chilperich. Between the 6th and 10th centuries, Ashkenazi traders operated throughout the Jewish world as the Radhanim, and Charlemagne, Ever the seeker of wisdom, even employed Jews to act as diplomats with the Muslim world. In fact, when Charlemagne sought to counter the power of Cordoba, it was a Jew, one Isaac le Juif, who secured a military alliance between the Frankish kingdom and the Abbasid Caliphate. But despite their relative freedom and mobility, the Ashkenazim remained marginal players in the world of Jewish thought. This is partly because, though we think today of Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jewry as two dominant ritual communities, this was not the case in the Middle Ages. Ashkenazi Jews were firmly within the Sephardic sphere of influence. Jews migrated between Iberia and Northern Europe all the time, and the two groups would not become culturally distinct until the early modern period. However, the lack of Ashkenazi influence within the Sephardic sphere can equally be attributed to the legacy of Charlemagne. Back in 814, Charlemagne had outlawed moneylending. According to the Christian reading of the Book of Exodus at that time, the charging of interest in loans was prohibited. However, under Jewish law, the prohibition in Exodus only applied to forced loans, loans within the Jewish community, and non-fixed interest rates. And as money lending was an essential component of economic growth, the Holy Roman Emperor Conrad II eventually repealed Charlemagne's blanket ban and implemented a new system called Schutzjude. This meant that all Jews in the empire were officially servants of the emperor, subjecting them to special taxes, but also placing them under his protection and enabling cities to establish segregated Jewish communities, or ghettos, for the purpose of money lending. This changed everything. Between 1034 and 1084, the bishops of Mainz, Worms, and Speyer established ghettos and brought in Jewish moneylenders, like the famous Mina of Worms. But they got much more. The wealth brought in by lending enabled the establishment of yeshivot, and the increase in Jewish population in these cities led to larger, more powerful rabbinic courts. In these three cities, Ashkenazi Jews finally had a great center of learning and law to equal those in Spain. And ultimately, it was a rabbi from this center who would lead the Jewish world headlong into the Rishonic era. Salomon de Troyes was actually born in the French dependency of Champagne, and came from a family of poor winemakers. But in 1057, his uncle, the chief rabbi of Mainz, sent Salomon to study for seven years at the yeshiva of Worms, where he became known by the acronym Rashi. In 1065, Rashi returned to Troyes, where he raised three daughters, continued making wine, became the chief rabbi, and founded his own yeshiva. It was there, in the 1080s and 90s, when he did his most important work, 
His commentary on the Aramaic translation of the Bible is a must-have text for any self-respecting Orthodox Jewish home, giving lots of interesting context from his studies and forms that, because it wasn't always relevant to the law, probably would have been lost to history. Like the Masoretes, he was very keen on linguistics, and always made sure to explain the meanings of difficult Hebrew and Aramaic words that lacked obvious equivalents in French. Even more ubiquitous is his commentary on the Talmud, which is now included as an integral part of the Talmudic page layout. Even his distinct handwriting was repurposed into a fancy-looking font after the invention of the printing press. But Rashi was not just a learned man. He was also a witness to the second major genocide against the Jewish people. It's time to talk about the First Crusade. Now, the First Crusade has been written about to death, but for those not in the know, so remember back in the Third Temple episode when I said that Orthodoxy and Catholicism were the same thing at the time? That's because the Church didn't actually have a supreme leader. Basically, the Church was divided into three administrative dominions called Sees, headquartered at Constantinople, Rome, and Antioch. The See of Rome had always had issues with the rest of the Church, partly because of some minor theological differences, but much more so because of disputes over religious icons, which eventually led most of central Italy to leave the Empire altogether and form the Papal States, but mostly because the Bishop of Rome, aka the Pope, claimed to be the supreme ruler of the entire Orthodox faith by virtue of holding the same office that had once been held by the Apostle Peter. Well, by 1054, things were really heated, with the Patriarch of Constantinople shutting down Latin churches in his city, which led Pope Leo IX to excommunicate the Patriarch. The Patriarch, not recognizing Leo's authority to excommunicate anyone, then excommunicated Leo, and now we finally have two churches. Fast forward 41 years. The Roman Empire had a new emperor, Alexios Komnenos, who just ended a quarter century of turmoil during which the Seljuk Turks had come in from Central Asia and ganked Anatolia. Recognizing that he had basically no chance of keeping the empire stable if he lost half of it, he made a proposal to the Pope. Raise an army of volunteers from the West to retake Anatolia, and I'll recognize you as the supreme figurehead of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And the Pope was all for it. But how was he going to sell the Western kingdoms on a war to increase the power of their erstwhile Byzantine rival? So he called a council and they figured it out. See, the Seljuks were Muslim, and the Fatimid Caliph, Al-Hakim the Amarala, had gone a little power mad and repressed Christians living under his rule, even burning down the Church of the Holy Sepulchre the site of Jesus' crucifixion. So what if that had happened almost a century earlier? So what if the church had already been rebuilt soon after and Christian pilgrimages had continued peacefully since? So what if the Fatimids and the Seljuks had nothing to do with each other, nor the Holy Land with Anatolia? The Muslim men must pay! No infidel is innocent! So Pope Urban II declared that anyone who took up arms against non-Christians would get total penance for all their sins, no questions asked. And you might see where this is going. Maybe it's a testament to how disconnected the church's leadership had become from ordinary people, but I think it's telling that Pope Urban never considered that the promise of total absolution of sin in exchange for killing non-Christians would appeal to anyone besides soldiers or politicians. In April 1096, some 40,000 mercenaries and peasants, including women and children, began what's called the People's Crusade. The first wave of People's Crusaders, under the priest Pierre Lermite, set off way too early and with no supplies, looted and murdered their way across Hungary and the Balkans, and was almost completely wiped out by the Turks as soon as they set foot in Anatolia. But the second wave, under Emiko, Count of Leiningen, decided to hang back for a moment. After all, the crusade wasn't set to begin until summer, but that didn't mean they couldn't start killing infidels right at home. At the end of April, a massacre of Jews broke out at Metz. When news of this reached the city of Speyer, Bishop Johannes invited the Jews of the city to take refuge in his palace. And when the Crusaders did come, only 12 Jews in the city were killed. In Worms, Bishop Adelbert did the same, bringing the Jews into his palace. Now, you might be surprised that Catholic bishops were offering protection to Jews. Part of it is that the bishops ran these cities. It was they who had invited the Jews to settle there in the first place. But the main issue is that this is obviously not what the church had wanted. But why let the very church you claim to be fighting for get in the way of a good crusade? Undeterred, the crusaders stormed the palace, captured the bishop, and forced the baptism of those hiding within. 800 Jews who refused baptism were put to the sword, including Mina. The carnage lasted a full week. As Emiko arrived at Mainz, the Jews there raised funds to pay Emiko to leave them alone. Emiko took their money, but he made no effort to stop his supporters from entering the city, killing 1,100. Cologne was the last city able to prevent mass slaughter. There, the Jews hid in the homes of their Gentile associates, and while the ghetto was looted and burned, only two were killed. Afterward, the Bishop of Cologne sent them to hide in friendly villages in the countryside, where they remained for the next month. Meanwhile to the east, a Saxon priest named Folkmar massacred Jews in Magdeburg and then Prague. And over the course of June, Offshoots of Emiko's crusaders massacred Jews in Trier, Neuss, Wefflinghofen, Eller, Xanten, Meer, Kerpen, Geldern, and Regensburg. 
For what details we have of these attacks, we can thank Rabbi Eliezer ben Natan, who lived through the deadliest of the killings as a child in Mainz. While Eliezer doesn't give complete figures for every city, the Jewish death toll in the Holy Roman Empire is estimated at just over 5,000, or 10% of all the Jews in Northern Europe at the time. They were men, women, and children. And so were the people who killed them. Due to their large numbers, the limited jurisdictions of the cities they terrorized, and the absence of the emperor, who was in Italy at the time, the killers were never prosecuted. However, after the initial wave of the People's Crusade, unsupplied and out of season, had ransacked the Hungarian countryside for food on their way to Constantinople, the king of Hungary declared Emiko's forces to be an invading army. Thousands of his civilian retinue were killed, most of his professional soldiers deserted to join the real crusaders, and Emiko returned to Germany, where he was roundly shunned for failing to reach the Holy Land. The Rhineland Massacres, as they are known today, are considered the second of the four major genocides against the Jewish people. But the carnage experienced in Ashkenaz paled in comparison to what took place in the Holy Land. And for that, we must return to the actual war. By 1099, the Crusaders had pushed through Anatolia and advanced into the Levant. They had long since stopped handing territory back to the Romans, instead carving out new states for themselves, and the endeavor quickly became an indiscriminate land grab with Jerusalem as the ultimate prize. By this time, the defense of Palestine had been taken over by the Fatimids in neighboring Egypt, who had successfully prevented the Crusaders from taking any territory in Lebanon or the Galilee. However, the Crusaders rejected a peace agreement and continued on to take control over maritime Judea. In June, Jerusalem's military governor, Iftikhar al-Dawla, expelled the city's Christians and poisoned the wells outside the city. It's commonly stated that al-Dawla had all the trees around Jerusalem cut down to prevent the Crusaders from building siege works, but nobody takes this claim seriously anymore, and if you've been to Jerusalem, you'll understand why. There had been deforestation, but it was not that total. In addition to being undersupplied, the Crusaders were also severely outnumbered. Of the 50,000 or so troops that had set out from Constantinople, only 13,000 had reached Jerusalem, partly reduced by casualties along the way, but mostly because the Crusaders had never been a unified force, and most of the factions participating in the war had already gone home. Iftikhar had 40,000 soldiers, and the city, and all of the water. It should have been a rout. But two things happened. Or rather, something didn't happen, and something else did. First, Iftihar did nothing. Unlike in the first century, medieval Jerusalem didn't have any inner defenses that the Fatimids could fall back to. And 40,000 men is way more than you'd need to defend a single 5-kilometer wall. Iftihar could have sent his reserves to meet the Crusaders outside, but he didn't because he could just wait for them to die of thirst, or to pin them with reinforcements that were already on their way from Egypt. Indeed, he easily repelled a Crusader assault on the 13th of June, but unbeknownst to him, the Crusaders also had reinforcements. On the 17th of June, a squadron of Genoese galleys landed in Jaffa. This is often presented as an amazing coincidence, but this is another myth. These were military supply ships, and they had been sent specifically to aid this siege. With all the food, water, and construction tools they needed, the Crusaders constructed siege works and began a second assault on the 14th of July. Raymond of Toulouse attacked from the south, in what might have been part of his well-known plans to get himself killed in the Holy Land. This wasn't the first attempt. However, his siege tower was burned down by the defenders, and his forces relocated to the Jaffa Gate. Everyone else attacked from the north, breaking through at the Temple Mount. Many Muslim civilians had taken refuge in the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, in the belief that it was the safest place. Instead, 10,000 were killed on the Temple Mount. That night, Iftikhar retreated to the Tower of David, where he offered his surrender to Raymond and was escorted out of the city with his retinue. Few others were so lucky. Jewish soldiers had defended Jerusalem alongside their Muslim compatriots. After the walls were breached, the Jewish defenders abandoned their posts and, in accordance with the rules of war in the Muslim world at the time, retreated to the main synagogue to be received mercifully with their families. Instead, the Crusaders gathered around the synagogue and burned it down with all inside, hoisting up their shields, circling the inferno, and cheerfully singing the hymn, Christ We Adore Thee, in celebration over the screams. Although some prominent Jews or Muslims were held for ransom, around 99% of the city's inhabitants were slaughtered. Of those Jews who were instead taken as prisoners, 
Most were released after receiving a ransom from the Karaite community in Ashkelon. The rest were either forced to convert to Christianity, deported to southern Italy, or taken out to sea and tossed overboard. Not long after Jerusalem's fall, crusaders killed the entire Jewish community of Haifa. As Jerusalem was organized into a kingdom run by the crusaders, and the knights established claims over various parts of the country, many more Jews were killed, and most of the rest fled to Egypt. Of the approximately 50,000 Jews living in Palestine at the outbreak of the war, as few as 200 remained by the summer of 1100, mostly in the rugged mountains of the Upper Galilee, where the Crusaders struggled to maintain control. Perhaps the Rhineland massacres are better remembered not because they had more dead, but because they had more survivors. And what of those survivors? Rashi died in 1105, and was buried at what later became a public square in Troyes. But his legacy continued. His three surviving daughters followed in their father's footsteps as scholars of the Torah, even taking on rituals that in the rest of the Jewish world were reserved for men. But this wasn't so unusual in Ashkenaz, and it set the stage for the next generation of great Jewish scholars. Their husbands, children, and grandchildren, along with many of Rashi's own students like Eliezer ben Natan, would go on to formulate and compose the majority of the additions, or tosafot, to the Talmud more or less completing the Talmud text as we know it today. In 1120, Pope Calixtus II issued Sicut Judeus, which forbade Roman Catholics from robbing or assaulting Jews, from forcing Jews to convert, or from interfering with Jewish holidays or graves on pain of excommunication. And finally, the 200 or so Jews that remained in the Galilee would form the beginnings of what is now known as the Old Yeshuv, the Jewish community that has existed continuously in the land of Israel since the time of the Second Temple. The First Crusade was only the beginning of centuries of brutal religious war, but it was also the high point of Crusader power. Eventually, Jerusalem would fall, and the Jews would return. Justice was coming. Special thanks to my patrons, including my Geonim, Lev Ham, Gary Davidson, Greg Maev, Vicky Nelson, and Ohm Weiss. If you like the channel and want to support it, consider becoming a patron. My Patreon is linked here. Otherwise, you can always like, share, subscribe, and hit that bell. I will see you next time.